Up next and every Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern, tune in to Grand Theft Auto Biographies with Guinness Walker. And don't forget Grand Theft Auto Geographies, Fridays at 9 a.m. Eastern. Only on Weasel, confirming your prejudices. Warning, this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave. And the stupid. And the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who roamed our beloved streets, causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Image, success, and legacy. I can't be touched! These are the main motivators for tonight's subject. We will take a look at the life of a man whose ambitions and aspirations took him to the top of the criminal heap in San Andreas during the 1990s, and whose manipulative persistence as a pusher, a player, and a money maker were practically unmatched. We will examine a man who lied, killed, and smoked his way to the most powerful and notorious narcotics distributor on the West Coast, and the many acts of treachery and moral depravity which facilitated his rise and subsequent fall. A man whose dreams may have been too big for his sizable britches, and whose actions nearly brought a city on the brink of chaos to its knees. Melvin Big Smoke Harris. This episode of Grand Theft Autobiography is brought to you by my incredible supporters on Patreon. Sign up today to get all the music from my shows, early access, and a spot in the credits. Thank you for watching. Melvin Harris was born most likely sometime in the early 1960s in Ganton, San Andreas, though as our regular viewers may already suspect, the details are incredibly hazy. It's possible Harris was born outside of Ganton, but it is with near certainty that he grew up on or very near to Grove Street, as from a presumably young age, he had joined the gang and begun slowly building a friendship with its leadership in the Johnson Brothers. Being closer in age to the Grove Street leader, Sean Sweet Johnson, Melvin would fairly easily work his way into the higher ranks of the family until becoming a lieutenant and a high-ranking set member by the mid-1980s, when Melvin was likely in his mid-twenties and now going exclusively by the street name Big Smoke. Smoke's upbringing and parents remain highly ambiguous, but many suspect that he was raised in a predominantly Christian household, as he was known to quote the Bible frequently to his friends, despite many of them believing his proselytizing to be part of the Big Smoke persona. Whatever Smoke's early childhood was like, he spent the vast majority of his youth and young adulthood as a gangbanger, performing drive-bys, participating in gang wars, tagging turf, and other delinquent activities, common among gangsters of America. Smoke would form strong friendships with many of the key players in Grove Street, including brothers to Sweet, Carl CJ, and Brian Johnson, as well as fellow Grove Lieutenant Lance Ryder Wilson, who takes a particular liking to him. During parts of the late 70s and the majority of the 1980s, Smoke would serve, presumably loyally, as an essential member of the gang, and earn his stripes of street respect as he gained notoriety and influence on the streets of Ganton. In 1987, an incident would occur with Carl Johnson resulting in the death of Brian, which fractures the gang's leadership when CJ leaves Los Santos to live on the East Coast and the Grove begins to rapidly decline in power, coinciding with the rising threat of heavy drugs being introduced into the city's poorer neighborhoods. We could not verify with complete certainty when Big Smoke betrayed his fellow gang members, but it is the speculation of this reporter and our team at GTA Biographies that Harris had been genuinely loyal to Grove Street for many years, and possibly all the way up to the death of Brian Johnson. When heavy drugs, most predominantly crack cocaine, began flooding the streets of Ganton and other neighborhoods, we believe that Melvin Harris was approached by the heavily corrupt crash division of the LSPD, under Frank Tenpenny and was pressured into facilitating the new drug sale all around Grove Territory. While it is our understanding that it was likely Crash themselves who initiated this unlikely partnership, there is little doubt that Smoke saw an opportunity to rise out of the poverty-stricken existence he and his friends had been subject to their whole lives, and unlike his fellow Grove Street gangsters, Big Smoke was willing to compromise his integrity if it meant becoming successful and leaving a lasting legacy. 
At some unknown point, but most likely following the death of Brian Johnson, Big Smoke would begin working in secret with the main rivals to Grove Street, the Ballas Gang, based out of neighborhoods like Glen Park and Jefferson. With the Grove Street leadership vehemently anti-cocaine and opposed to any of their members making profit off the growing epidemic, Big Smoke would make deals with the leadership of the Ballas and begin selling and distributing crack all around the city of Los Santos, while continuing to maintain his position as a high-ranking member of Grove Street. Smoke would attempt many times, unsuccessfully, to convince Grove Street leader Sean Sweet Johnson to allow the sale and distribution of cocaine on top of the marijuana and PCP the gang already sold, all the while pretending to defer to Sweet as the head of the gang, despite acting directly against the gang's interests for many years, without anyone else knowing. We believe this is further evidence that Big Smoke was originally loyal to his friends, but when given the choice between perceived success, fame, and power, or his friendships, he opted to pursue his own self-interest, while trying to convert the likes of Sweet to prioritize profit over integrity. At some point, likely in the early 1990s, Smoke would also move out of Ganton and off of Grove Street, purchasing a new house in Idlewood with his drug money, and claiming the funds came from his aunt. Big Smoke would also form alliances with Mexican gang the Los Santos Vagos and the Russian Mafia, who had been trying to gain a foothold on the Western drug market and continue to expand his network of distributors, street dealers, and enforcers, all in secret. At this time, Smoke would also approach his friend and fellow high-ranking Grove Street gangster, Lance Ryder Wilson, and begin planting seeds of doubt in Sweet's leadership in the OG. Eventually, Smoke would manage to convince Ryder to join him in the growing crack cocaine trade, and defect to the Balas, while maintaining his usual persona, and the two would continue poisoning their gang from the inside out. With his empire growing exponentially thanks to his new allies, and the influence of Crash on the dwindling grove, and their facilitation of drugs being moved on the streets, Big Smoke would plot an assassination attempt, we believe with Tenpenny's assistance, and even attempt to frame the attack as the first act in a Grove Street civil war by stealing the iconic vehicle, the Green Sabre. After planning the details with members of the Balas, the Sabre would roll through the quiet streets of Ganton on a dry night in mid-1992, and fire a volley of submachine gun rounds into the Johnson family house intending to kill Sweet. Due to incompetence, or some believe, additional orders given to the assassins, possibly by Frank Tenpenny, the gunman would fail to kill Sweet, who was in his own home at the time and not the family home, instead killing the mother of the Johnson clan, Beverly and unintentionally ushering the return of former Lieutenant Carl C.J. Johnson for the subsequent funeral. Perhaps feeling guilty for the death of Beverly Johnson, or perhaps simply seeking to continue playing the concerned friend to Sweet, Big Smoke would watch over the empty Johnson house briefly while awaiting the funeral, and mistake the returning Johnson brother for a burglar before reuniting with his childhood friend. C.J. Okay, man? Nah, man. It's my mom's, homie. Hey, I don't know why this had to happen, but I promise you, I'm gonna find out who killed your moms. The streets is cold, dog. Like it says in the book, we are blessed and cursed. What fucking book? Same things make us laugh, make us cry. But right now, we gotta take care of our business. Go see your brother at the cemetery. Come on, let's bounce. Though Smoke appeared genuinely happy to see Carl after his five-year absence, he would drive CJ to his mother's funeral, where an ambush by Balas attempting to kill Sweet would take place, in which the Balas explicitly did not target Smoke or Ryder due to their secret alliance, something the Johnson brothers wouldn't pick up on at the time. It may have even been further planned for the Balas to throw the Johnson brothers off of Smoke's trail when they destroy his brand new car during the initial drive-by. This event was very likely another assassination attempt on Big Smoke's part, at the very least alerting the Balas to the funeral and not interfering with their attempts to kill Sweet and Carl. When all four managed to reach Grove Street alive, Big Smoke would continue to serve as the pseudo-wise man of the gang and return to his diplomatic approach of trying to convince Sweet to change his tune. Hey, you gotta keep it real, man. Man, nobody give a shit about the hood. I do. All they do is sell yay and ruin the place. No crack ever made a gang type. I don't know, man. What's up, y'all? What's up, CJ? What's crack? Man, all they care about is smoking and money. You can't knock a homie's hustle, sweet. And Mark say soldiers. They idiots trying to be businessmen. Yeah, but they down with us, man. All they down with is money. CJ, go down there and show these fools you mean business. These chunks from the balls are sweating the homies. Go put pressure on them. Let's do it. We've been putting time in the hood, but we got to get the homies back together. Like the old days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you right. So you and Ryder go handle your business. Man, they're slang to their own mama. They don't care about nothing. You're naive, my friend. We gotta keep our focus. 
Still having no success in changing Sweet's mind, it's possible that Smoke planned yet another assassination attempt, though it may have been simple coincidence, when the group of Smoke, Ryder, Sweet, and CJ get fast food at a Cluckin' Bell in Bala's territory, as suggested by Smoke himself. It may be further evidence that the event was planned, when Smoke deliberately spent a ridiculous amount of time ordering his massive food order, perhaps to delay the group from leaving the drive-thru before the assassins arrived, although this could be simply because Smoke was a large man who enjoyed eating as much as any red-blooded American ought to. I'll have two number nines, a number nine large, a number six with extra dip, a number seven, two number 45s, one with cheese, and a large soap. Hey, sorry, bruh. You know I gotta know about mine. I know, CJ, I know. I'm just trying not to think about it, so. I mean, I didn't even know she was hit until it was all over. Yeah, right, 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 right. Let's eat. Hey, don't we got beef around here? We've been getting into it with these fools. I can't stand cold food. Unlike you, I ain't never ate from a trash can. <laughs> oh, shit. Trash can, bitch. Pass me my food. Hey, hey, look. Kilo Trey scoping us out. Damn, Ryder, you are jinx. Shit, the motherfuckers headed to the hood. Drive by! After an intense shootout with the Bala's car in which Smoke intentionally avoided killing any of his secret allies, he would once again change tactics, likely in an effort to avoid any suspicion, and begin helping CJ in the gross effort against the much more powerful Bala's. Having now failed, allegedly, to kill Sweet three separate times, Smoke would help Carl Johnson to secure a weapons supplier for the Grove, an old family friend, Emmett, of the now fractured Grove Street set Seville Boulevard families. It's possible Smoke simply went along with the plan to arm the Grove to maintain his cover, though we here at GTA Biographies believe this may have been yet another attempt by Smoke to hinder the growth of the gang, while appearing on the surface to actually be helping it, with Emmett's supply being particularly subpar compared to the AK-47 toting Bala's. That's my man right there, you know what I'm saying? Hey! Who shot at me? What you kids want? Hey, hey, Pops! Hey, what's happening? Aren't you Beverly Johnson's boy? That's right. Right. Say, ain't, ain't you dead? No, nah, Emmett. The other one, Carl. I'm s sorry about Beverly. That's why we're here, sir. We want to get the people who did it. Well... You come to the right place. Try anything you like, boy. Man, look at this old shit. Though most of Smoke's actions at this time seem to reflect his true intentions upon further scrutiny, there is at least one known event from around this time in which Smoke was confirmed to have fired on his secret Bala's allies, when he participated in a drive-by shooting alongside the other Grove leaders in several neighborhoods across the city. Whether or not Smoke was identified by the Balas for his role in these attacks, or that he'd arranged for the deaths to be forgiven, remains unknown. But whatever the case, it doesn't appear to have affected Smoke's position among the Balas or his other allies at the time. With Sweet still alive and CJ continuing to make hay for his many allies, Smoke would begin hiring Carl directly to assist him in secretive errands that facilitated the growth or maintenance of his empire, while pretending all of his dealings were in fact to help the Grove. From his house in Idlewood, Smoke would go with CJ to see the release of their childhood friend Jeffrey Martin, or some say Jeffrey Cross, who would go on to be an asset of Big Smoke's, and later Smoke would go on to hire CJ directly to deal with parties who interfered with his drug trade. Okay. My cousin Mary's in there. Sweet, sticky, bud fresh off the plantation. Here, pull up here, let me do the talk. Man, I should've known. Hey, excuse me, Jose. Yo soy el grando smokio, and I want that grass, comprende? <laughs> hey, fuck you, cabron. What? Now that ain't nice. Coffee, yo, up El Wido before I blow your brains out all over the patio. Chinga tu madre, pendejo. Oh, man, let me get to here. Fuck this, man. Fuck this. Get him smoke. Yeah, yeah, go get that shit now. Get him. What you talk about? Yeah, fuck a big smoke. Remember that name. 
Smoke would also have Carl assist him in taking down a group of Los Santos Vagos, meeting with a northern Mexican gang, the San Fierro Rifa, at Unity Station, and attempting to ambush them. The Mexican gangsters would flee onto the roof of a passing passenger train, forcing CJ and Smoke to chase them by motorcycle halfway across the state before Smoke finally manages to kill all of them and the two return to Smoke's home. It is unclear if Smoke's reasoning for attacking these particular Vagos was due to their deal being in conflict with existing deals between Smoke and his other allies, or some other unknown reason. But whatever the case, the fact that no witnesses survived to speak of Smoke's actions likely explains why he never saw retribution from his supposed allies. What are we looking for, Smoke? Some Vagas cats meeting some San Fierro reef cutting some kind of deal. San Fierro? I thought Northern Mexicans don't mix with Los Santos SAs. Shit, you got me. That look like them. Motherfuckers clocked us. We gotta get those fools. In another move against a group that Smoke had previous association with, on a tip from Officer Tenpenny, he would also have Carl assist him in taking down a group of Russian Mafia gangsters who were attempting to enter the arms trade. Hey, CJ! Baby, what's up, man? What's happening, Smoke? Chilling. Wanna go for a ride? Yeah. You drive. All right. We going downtown. Smoke would presumably attempt peace talks initially, but quickly be overwhelmed by the Russians, forcing him and CJ to shoot their way out of the building and then through the streets of Los Santos on motorcycle. The two would manage to escape the pursuers and kill many of them along the way before parting ways once again. During this time, Carl Johnson had been near single-handedly repairing the grove and bringing it back to fighting strength to compete with the Balas, and eventually, after efforts by CJ, Sweet, and even Smoke's second-in-command, Ryder, brokered a meeting to reunite the fractured Grove Street sets. At the Jefferson Motel, Sweet Johnson would prepare to meet with the other gang leaders with Ryder, CJ, and Smoke backing him up. But in what may have well been Smoke's fourth attempt to have Sweet killed, the meeting would be ambushed by LSPD forces, who storm the building and send the gang's leaders, scrambling. Okay, it's strictly one rep per set. You guys will have to wait here. We'll be there just in case, bruh. Thanks, homie, but I'm down with these boys. I don't like this, man. Look at all them other family hoods. They used to be Grove Streets. Relax. We straight, they straight. How about you, Smoke? Hey, I'm feeling a little exposed, but I'm good. I ain't leaving my brother. I ain't no buster. Man, it's every motherfucker for himself. CJ and Sweet would manage to survive the chaos and flee to the building's roof, before escaping to the street below, where Big Smoke and Ryder arrive just in time to get the Johnson brothers to safety. While it is mere conjecture on our part, we here at GTA Biographies believe that given the previous actions of Big Smoke and his connection to corrupt forces of the LSPD through Crash, he very well may have been responsible for the ambush at the motel, though it is worth pointing out some possible evidence to the contrary. While it is true that Smoke had a previous motive and history of attempting to kill Sweet, he did return to save the brothers when he and Ryder had already abandoned the fight, with a seemingly plausible explanation for doing so. However, this could simply be an effort to avoid showing his cards too early by rescuing Sweet conveniently, just in case he did survive. Shit! That's gonna be a hell of a story to tell when we pass in the blunt. Man, that was some serious shit. Woo! Fuck this! We gotta get out of here! Ryder's right. Everybody split up, we'll meet up later. Having survived the Motel Massacre, Sweet would double down on his efforts to reunite the fractured Grove Street sets, and Smoke would take the opportunity to plan yet another attempt on Sweet's life by meeting with his Bala's allies in Crash under an overpass downtown. Unbeknownst to Smoke, CJ would witness his meeting and finally piece together the truth about his mother's death and Smoke's true allegiances, though Johnson would continue to deny it for a time. Oh, no. Shit, Smoke, what you into? Shh, that's it. Look at that ride. 
That's the motherfucking green saber. Shit, smoke. Crash making you sell us out? Moms. Sorry, Issy. I heard a rumor and poked around. I didn't believe it myself, but... Nah, nah, you did the right thing. I owe you, C's. I gotta go tell Sweet about... Oh, fuck! Sweet! Look, go get Kendall and take her to a safe place. What you thinking? It's Sweet. I think him and the homies is walking into a trap. Just go. Go! Luckily for Smoke, his tip to the Balas and Tenpenny would finally result in a clear-cut victory in his favor when both Johnson brothers are arrested, with Sweet being sent to a prison upstate and CJ taken into custody by Crash to continue serving as their unwilling lackey. With both CJ and Sweet exiled from Los Santos, Smoke would finally drop his charade of being loyal to the Grove and fully embrace his position as a high-ranking member of the Balas and allow them to take outright control of all former Grove Street territories. He would also begin serving as the manager of Jeffrey O.G. Loke Martin and use this position to serve as a public front for his new persona as a philanthropist and community builder, as well as an excuse for his obscene wealth, which would now only begin to multiply. Now able to focus on his true pursuits, Big Smoke would purchase a lavish penthouse apartment in East Los Santos and continue expanding his empire's distribution capabilities. He would have a drug lab constructed inside the building and staff it with dozens of loyal Bala gang members and other allies, all prepared to defend the massive fortune of illicit substances being churned out of the building and the man in charge of the entire operation. In a blatant demonstration of Big Smoke's massive ego and overly inflated opinion of himself, he would even have the audacity to have an enormous statue constructed in his likeness, in his penthouse lounge, and began spending ridiculous amounts of money on luxuries, video games, and body armor, all the while consuming his own product on the daily. He would make a deal with the San Fierro-based Loco Syndicate led by Jizzy B to widen his horizons, and distribute his product in the city by the bay with regular money deliveries by his couriers to the Syndicate every Monday and Friday. But unfortunately for him, Carl Johnson, who had since moved to San Fierro himself, would begin infiltrating the organization as a bodyguard for Jizzy. Eventually, CJ would manage to take out the entire Syndicate's leadership, including Big Smoke's liaison to the group, Lance Ryder Wilson, and destroy their main distribution centers in San Fierro. But Big Smoke would not be deterred and continued to operate his empire from the safety of his loft in East LS. Not long after the death of Ryder, Smoke would go on to give a public interview on the WCTR program Entertaining America as the manager of OG Loke, proclaiming his philanthropy and status as a community leader to the world. A lot of people say gangster rap is misogynistic posturing by fake-ass idiots who spend more time in drama school than they ever did pimping or hustling dope. Well, I assure you, OG Loke is the real thing. He's hated women all his life. He's sold drugs to school children. He's murdered innocent people just for kicks. But he rhymes like an angel. And I assure you, it's all in a good cause. So either way, you can feel good about yourself listening to this music. Well, that was very informative. Big Smoke is doing a lot for the community or, or to it. He sounds like a great guy. In late 1992, Carl Johnson would return to Los Santos for the second time, on a mission to get even with both Frank Tenpenny and Big Smoke himself, who would spend this time attempting to maintain control of his crumbling empire. Though Smoke and the Balas would fight desperately to maintain control of their territories at this time, the all-out assault by the returning CJ, along with the recently released Suite, would quickly prove too much for the Balas, who were being spread thinner by the day, and quickly losing funds. When a trial takes place for Smoke's crash allies Frank Tenpenny and Eddie Pulaski, who had recently gone missing, and a not guilty verdict is delivered, the entire city of Los Santos is sent into a tizzy with riots springing up all across town, and only further fueling the Grove in their all-out assault to take back their old neighborhoods. After several days of fighting, the Grove would successfully take back all of their previously lost territory, and even several of the Bala's key neighborhoods in Idlewood and Glen Park. With the tables quickly turning, Big Smoke would remain cooped up in his crack palace, playing video games, and dishing out orders, as he had always done, until finally, inevitably, he was confronted by his old friend Carl Johnson for the last time. Hey, Smoke! Hey, CJ, I was wondering when you would show up. How'd you know it was me? Knew it was my old dog, CJ. Knew you was coming and I don't give a shit. I'm here to take care of your fat ass. Then I'ma take care of your friends in the police department. Where they at? Man, fuck this shit. 
<coughs> Man, that's some good shit. Man, you and Ten Penny. Man, fuck Ten Penny and fuck his Polish lapdog and fuck the police, man. Oh, that's old shit. Look at you, you got the whole world. I ain't got no regrets, man. Smoke, you have. I made a CJ. I'm a success. I can't be touched. I don't give a fuck. Fuck the whole world. What happened to you, man? Man, what the fuck do you care? Uh, I guess we better do this shit then. Though Melvin Harris would try his hardest to kill his childhood friend CJ, even bringing in numerous Ballas soldiers to aid him in the fight, in the end, Carl would gun down Smoke, and in his final moments, he would confess that the allure of riches and power had blinded him, but he would die with some twisted satisfaction, knowing that his legacy would forever be remembered. Hey Smoke, what made you flip out like that, man? Was it the drugs or what? I got caught up in the money, <coughs> the power, I don't give a shit. Oh, fuck, man. <coughs> Why you just didn't quit, man? We was like family, homie. I had no choice. I had to do it. I just see the opportunity. <coughs> oh, when I'm gone, everyone gonna remember my name. Big Smoke. Oh. Melvin Big Smoke Harris was many things at first glance. A pseudo-philosopher, religious adherent, comically self-indulgent eater, and gangster wise man. But when one digs deeper at the heart of what made the man known as Big Smoke tick, it is without a doubt the desire to be remembered as a great influencer and a great man. For most of Big Smoke's life, he appears to have been genuinely loyal to the fellow Grove Street gangsters, but took an opportunity that was presented to him and made it work in his favor, even if it meant screwing over the people he considered friends. Despite eventually trying to kill Sweet and Carl Johnson on numerous occasions, he had spent many hours arguing in good faith with Sweet in an attempt to make him see the potential benefits in allowing the sale of cocaine in Grove-controlled neighborhoods, despite failing each and every time to break any ground. Before his betrayal became known to the Grove, Smoke was known for being an optimistic, charismatic, and long-winded philosopher type to his friends, and unlike the hardline Sweet seemed to encourage and sympathize with the distraught Carl Johnson following his return to LS with his mother's death despite being inadvertently responsible for it in an effort to kill his brother. What Smoke's true desires were remains highly contested, as the man rarely allowed anyone to see the real him. While working against his Grove Street friends in secret, he would also participate in at least one shootout against his supposed Bala's allies, and help the Johnson brothers on another occasion. Though as we speculated before, it is unknown if Smoke played a role in these events to begin with, not unlike his involvement with killing Beverly Johnson. One of the only known instances of Big Smoke dropping his Bible-quoting West Coast wise man persona and being real was in his final moments before death, after being mortally wounded in battle by his old friend CJ. Smoke even appears to have been at least somewhat remorseful in his final moments, claiming that he'd had no choice when he was originally confronted by Tenpenny, but quickly becoming caught up in the money and power which came along with being a drug baron for the city. The most important thing to Big Smoke was always that he be remembered. Having grown up in poverty like the rest of the Grove Street Boys, he likely dreamed of escaping that world like the few exceptions the group would hear about in popular music and movies. This may even explain why Big Smoke sought out Jeffrey Martin following his rise in status in the Ellis rap scene, ironically thanks to help from the man who would go on to kill Smoke. It's unknown if Smoke's attachment to OG Loke was entirely out of convenience, or as another means of vicariously living the life of a famous music manager and philanthropist for his city, despite in reality being the main source of his community's degradation. Smoke's philanthropy is another example of Harris attempting to have his cake and eat it too, similar to and perhaps even inspired by the likes of international drug kingpins like Pablo Escobar, who would use his ill-gotten gains to try and enter the world of politics. Big Smoke would use his drug money to help his community, at least on the surface, though many suspect that all of his supposedly altruistic endeavors were simply more fronts for laundering his dirty money and attempting to look legit while operating as the city's poison salesman. In the end, Big Smoke would get what he wanted, in a way as the city that he helped bring to its knees remembered his legacy of partially bringing about the 92 riots for his complicity in helping crash, and the brothers he once called friends remembering him as a selfish and callous individual who only looked out for himself, despite outwardly proclaiming to be everybody's best friend. Melvin Harris wasn't known as Big Smoke for nothing. He was a very large African-American man of average height, who like his fellow Grove Street gangsters was almost exclusively seen wearing his gang's colors, green, along with his signature bowler's hat. 
Smoke suffered from bad eyesight, and as a result wore glasses seemingly his entire adult life. And while it isn't known exactly when he became the size he was eventually known for, given that he appears to have had the nickname Big Smoke for the vast majority of his life, it seems safe to assume that from a young age, Smoke was more than happy to eat more than everyone around him. While Smoke would eventually drop his persona as Grove Street Leader and make it known to the gangs of Los Santos that he worked with the Palas, for some reason, he would continue to wear the colors of his former gang right up to his dying breath. Perhaps as a sign of respect for the Grove, which he tried to help in his eyes, or perhaps out of simple laziness. As a gangbanger, Big Smoke has no shortage of potential charges to be laid at his feet, despite never being caught by the police outside of the highly corrupt crash. While his direct crimes are far fewer than those of a man like Carl Johnson, he still has a hefty body count on top of numerous other potential crimes and accessory charges, for his role as a gangbanger and later a drug baron for the city of Los Santos. While Smoke's crimes in his early days are hard to quantify, let's take a look at the crimes we were able to confirm he committed, which mostly occurred during 1992 and the highly publicized news media storm that surrounded the city following the riots. Participating in numerous gangbangs, drive-bys, and other illegal activities from his youth to 1987. Drug dealing on numerous occasions prior to 1992. Illegal street gambling. The first attempted murder of Sweet Johnson. Conspiracy accessory murder of Beverly Johnson. The possible second attempted murder of Sweet Johnson. The murder of several Bala soldiers in a drive-by in 1992. Assault on a Vagos gang member. Accessory murder of a Vagos gang member. The murder of four Vagos gangsters and the theft of a motorcycle. The murder of several Russian Mafia soldiers. Accessory murder of dozens of Russian Mafia soldiers and possible theft of another motorcycle. Accessory murder of dozens of gangsters at the Jefferson Motel Massacre, evading the police in a street chase, and the manslaughter of several motorists when Smoke sends the group's car crashing into a tanker on the freeway. Accessory murder of dozens of Grove Street gangsters at the Mullahan intersection the sale and distribution of drugs throughout Los Santos and San Fierro, presumed money laundering in philanthropic endeavors to clean his money, possession and consumption of an absurd amount of drugs, primarily crack cocaine, the attempted murder of Carl Johnson. While the numbers for Big Smoke's direct involvement in numerous crimes may seem underwhelming for a man who controlled the Los Santos drug scene at the height of the crack cocaine epidemic, if one considers the number of deaths by overdose, gang warfare, and other indirect means, then Big Smoke's tallies start to seem far more egregious. As the single most powerful man in the LS criminal underworld outside of Frank Tenpenny, at least for a brief period in 92, Big Smoke is without a doubt responsible for the deaths of many, and the destruction of many more lives, thanks to his relentless push as the crack cocaine fairy of San Andreas. What makes a man sell his soul? Money? Power? Influence? For tonight's subject, the answer was all of the above. Pursuit of the almighty dollar has a tendency to ruin otherwise well-intentioned actors on the great American stage, and tonight was just another example of that fact. America is a dangerous place, folks, and the allure of attaining the American dream and holding place among the upper echelon seems to show no signs of slowing for the criminal-minded among us. Stay indoors, people. You never know if that streetwise preacher you saw outside the liquor deli is secretly orchestrating the next great American drug epidemic. I'll see you next time for another exciting edition of Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching.
All we had to do was follow the damn train, CJ. 